Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today. I want to do a bit of a book review. Here is Mike Caveney's Sawing Illusion. Uh, you know what? He has done the definitive history of the sawing illusion. I'm going to put a link below. I, uh, uh, about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago, I tried to do a history of the sawing illusion. This was long before I knew Mike Caveney was working on it. By the way, I purchase almost everything Mike Caveney puts out. If it's historical, historically significant, I will purchase it. I just love his work. I love his scholarship. I love his books. I have tons of them. And he just is, is brilliant. So whenever he puts something out, buy it. Look at the size of this book. It is mammoth. And, the, and it is so lavishly illustrated. Let me just show you this inside cover right here. It is so lavishly illustrated, it is brilliant. This particular book is number 224 of a thousand. There are 100 deluxe editions if you want the deluxe edition. It was published in 2021 by Mike Caveney's Magic Words. I cannot speak more highly about it. One of the things that struck me, you know, when I, when I did the, the history of the illusion, I was interested in who did what. You know, that was my focus. Mike Caveney has done a very deep dive, and as I read through the book, I noticed something that I think, I think is significant about magic in general, not just about the sawing illusion. If you don't know, I mean, I'll give you a real quick sketch here. Uh, so P.T. Selbit comes up with what is basically a sawing through illusion. He takes his assistant and he ties her into a crate. You cannot see her feet. You cannot see her head. However, there's a rope around her wrists that's fed through the, the trunk. There is a rope around her ankles that's fed through the trunk. And those ropes are held by spectators. And then he saws down through the trunk, saws completely through it. The trunk is opened. She stands out, the ropes are cut, and she's freed. It's a brilliant effect. Alan Wakeling later did a variation of that, known as the Wakeling sawing, which I think is superior to the Selbert version. You can see this all over the internet. Kaylin and Ginger uh, made it famous, I think. So P.T. Selbert believes uh, he's the only person. This is he invented the illusion in 1920 and really premiered it in, 19, in 1921. So it's over 100 years old at this point. The significance of Mike Caveney producing this in 2021, celebrating 100 years of the sawing illusion. Uh, but as I, as I read through this, I, I, saw, I saw a pattern that I think, now, now the pattern is not in the book, but I made an observation that I think this pattern exists in magic. So across the pond, P.T. Selbit is English. Across the pond, you have Horace Golden, who is coming up with his own version of the effect. In Horace Golden's version, you can actually see the, the woman's head and, and, and hands go through holes in the cabinet, and her feet extend through holes in the other cabinet. He saws through and he separates the two halves. So it's a, it's a significant difference between what P.T. Selba was doing, what Horace Golden was doing. Now Horace Golden didn't, didn't content himself to say, well, I have a better version or I have a different version and that's okay. Live and let live. P.T. Selba can perform his version. I'll perform mine and we'll all be happy. For some reason, magicians don't do this. They decide they're going to sue each other. So Golden applies for patents and then proceeds to try to inhibit not only P.T. Selbit, but anyone from performing this effect. He wants to be the only person performing the sawing illusion. And something I did not know was that there was a, I don't, I don't want to use the word syndicate, but I can't think of a better word, syndicate of vaudeville theaters. And you were either in with the syndicate or you were out with the syndicate. And Horace Goldman was in. So P.T. Selbit had to perform in different, different ways and different avenues and different theaters. Uh, but Mike Caveney does a real deep dive into this and gives insight that I've never had before. 
But here's the, here's the pattern that I think is fairly consistent with magic. And, you know, we, we can criticize this pattern. We can criticize people who steal from other people. But over the history of magic, magic itself, the art itself, has been enhanced and improved by this struggle. So you have an inventor, in this case, P.T. Selvin. He invents an illusion, and other performers see and, or hear about this illusion, and they decide that they want to do the, the effect. So they either, they either come up with their own version of it, or they steal the version that's being done. And they start to perform. And then the, the inventor of the effect says, wait a minute, wait a minute, you're stealing from me. And so there's a dispute. There's a dispute about ownership. There's a dispute about patent. Uh, and some of these things make it to the courts. The fact is, Horace Golden was suing people left and right. And the lawsuits were heavily publicized, which drew attention to the effect, which drew people into the theater. So Horace Golden was very much using litigation as a means of publicity. Uh, so this kind of dispute would happen. but. But along the road, there are copyists, there are theft, there's theft, there's all this going on. But every performer who picks up, every performer who picks up the prop, who picks up the effect, contributes something to it. Makes a variation, makes a change, makes it a little bit better. And over time, it begins to evolve. Then what happens is somebody comes along, and, and this happened with the sawing illusion. It was beginning, the, the popularity was beginning to ebb. People were leaving the theater. They weren't quite as thrilled. So somebody comes along and they expose it. Here's how you do it. So now that method is off the table. Well, does that mean that the effect is over? Does it mean that the, the illusion dies? No. Someone else comes along, takes, takes that method, makes a whole different method, and improves the effect again. So you get invention, theft, dispute, copyists, exposure. Then you get revisions of the effects that are so greatly improved from the original. And the whole cycle starts again. And that cycle is illustrated in here. Now, there are some anecdotes in here. I just want to give you a sense for two. Two that have really struck me. I hope they strike you as well, and I'll try to explain why they impacted me the way that they did. So here on page 81, Mike Haveney is, is dealing with Survey Leroy. Survey Leroy is, I just love the guy. I, 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 one of these days I'm going to do a presentation on Survey Leroy himself. But I did not know that he was one of the people that Horace Goldwyn, Golden uh, more or less franchised to go out and perform his version of the sawing. Uh, now, this is an interesting discussion. This is the kind of discussion you get in this book, where he says, Golden always admitted that Jansen, Harry Jansen, was the one who first suggested tapering the edge of the sawing table. But Survey Leroy first conceived of the wedge-based principle for his Ajra levitation table in 1902. You see, I mean, that's fantastic detail. Now there's another there's another story about about Survey Leroy that I want to share with you. So here's the other story, page 84. While appearing in Milwaukee, Leroy received a telegram from the manager of the St. Louis St. Louis Theater, where he would be soon appearing. He wanted to know if Leroy would be willing to saw a lady in half in front of a team of doctors. Leroy's reply was sent back immediately, yes, with great pleasure. Please invite all private practitioners to attend. He assumed that this was just a publicity stunt that he had concocted by the theater manager. Upon arriving in St. Louis, he was surprised to learn that the demonstration was to take place the following morning in the mayor's office. Not one, not one to back down from a challenge, Leroy set out to solve the many problems presented by this unusual location. The next morning, right on schedule, the box was carried up front steps of City Hall, followed by the saw, a team of assistants, and lastly, the extra-thin Ajra-style table. Little did anyone realize that the second lady was already concealed in the table. 
while nurses laid out a number of towels, bottles, large sponge on the floor, the doors on the box were intentionally kept closed. It was obvious that the doctor suspected that a second lady was hiding inside the box. Meanwhile, a couple of assistants tipped the table up on its side, screwed the four legs in place, and set the table upright. Then amid such much fanfare, the victim entered the room. The doors of the box were open, revealing for the first time that it was completely empty. The box was placed onto the table. The lady climbed inside and was duly cut in half. Within a matter of moments, the equipment, with the second lady still concealed in the table, was on its way back to safety in the theater. Now, the reason I share that anecdote with you, if you missed it in the telling of the story, here's what happened. So the golden, golden version requires two people. One is concealed inside, the other one gets, gets in and everyone sees her as the assistant. They, they're not aware of the second person in the box. Surveillor Roy has to do this in the mayor's office, which is up, up a few flights of stairs. He can't go in there with his prop set up and have someone go into the box. It would reveal the secret. So he, he conceals the assistant in the box and then they carry it and they treat the box as if it's empty, conveying the illusion without stating so that the box is empty. I think it's brilliant. I think it's the kind of thing that Surveillor Roy or any great magician is going to do. They're going to go to this great extent and you're going to assume, well, you know what? Nobody could be concealed in that box. They carried it up all these stairs. They put it together in front of me. She gets inside. I mean, there, there had to have been a sense of great mystery when he did that because they could not conceive that there might have been someone else in there given the way he did it, the way he presented it. I, th I think it tells us something about the, the illusion, but more importantly about Survey Leroy. Great performer. Another anecdote that I'd like to share with you, and the reason I'm doing this is, you know, I found this book valuable in, in, in two ways. One, it is the most exhaustive history of the sewing illusion ever put into print or ever done anywhere. It is lavishly illustrated. It is lavishly illustrated. It is incredibly thoroughly researched. I just love it. But the other thing I love about this book are the anecdotes, the side stories that you're getting. Now, let, let me share this one with you. I just, I was just, it wasn't so much that it adds to the story of the sawing illusion, but it adds to the story of Di Vernon in, in a way. I've never heard the story before. I was amused. I, I think you'll like it too. It's page 186. Sam Margulis, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing that name correctly or what. Sam Margulis was a young magician who had grown up in New York and knew everyone in the business. He convinced Horace Golden to let him take a unit of his sewing illusion to a small theater at Coney Island. A petite young girl named Jean Hayes was spotted walking down the boardwalk and she was hired to work in the illusion. At four feet, nine inches tall, she was the perfect size to act as the feet, which meant that much of the time between one o'clock in the afternoon and 11 o'clock at night, she spent inside the table, but for $25 a week, she was all in. The canvas banner hanging up front of the theater read, Girls sold in half as long as supplies last. Problems arose when Jean would take a hot dog into her hiding place. On more than one occasion, the combination of full stomach, the hot humid weather, and lack of air caused her to fall asleep. At the critical moment when the foot switch was supposed to take place, the male assistant would have to bang on the table in order to wake her up so she'd stick her feet through. When Golden himself turned up one afternoon to see how his friend was making out, Sam was determined to keep his hidden assistant awake. Limburger cheese was inserted into a number of air holes, and it was all Jean could do to not burst through the trap doors for a breath of fresh air. Divern was an old friend of Margulies, and upon returning from one of his card hustler expeditions, he ventured out to Coney Island. Sam welcomed Vernon with all arms, with open arms, and immediately put him to work, presenting 20 minutes of magic as a warm-up act 
while they were busy selling tickets out front. At the end of the summer season, Margulaz uh, was invited to bring his sewing illusion to Havana, Cuba. Gene elected to stay home, but Vernon tagged along. During their run in Cuba, Sam generally presented the sewing illusion while Vernon did the warm-up act, but on occasion, on occasion, Vernon handled both jobs. That's right, the professor appeared as a stage illusionist doing the golden version. When the mobsters stepped in and the cost of staying in, the cost of staying in business became prohibitive, Sam decided to return to New York. But Vernon stayed in Havana to cut silhouettes. After, after eight enjoyable months, he too returned to Manhattan, where he found Sam still working the sawing illusion. For, For a three-day three bazaar, Sam hired Jean to be the feet and Vernon to cut silhouettes. It was during this event that a romance blossomed between Jean and Di. They were married at the little church around the corner in New York City. And you know what? This book is full. Every single page has an anecdote just like that. So, hey, Mike Caveney, thank you so much for a brilliant book. Uh, listen, I have read almost every historical book that Mike Caveney has written. None are better than this one. It, it will give you insight into the golden age like no other history because you're taking a single illusion and you're looking at very closely the evolution of that illusion from, from the time it was invented in 1920 to the present time. Absolutely fantastic. I cannot recommend it more highly. Folks, thank you so much for joining me. Please subscribe if you've not done so already. Please comment down below. I love your comments. I will see you next time.